Denny. Hi, Nancy. Welcome to episode 85 of the Front Porch Book Club. The Front Porch Book Club is a podcast that meets twice a month. We like to dig deep into the relationship between characters and the worlds they live in. Grab your book and iced tea and join us on the Front Porch. So, Lenny, last month we talked about the New York Times critics list of 100 best books in the 21st century. And one of our books, Far From the Tree, by Andrew Solomon, was on that list. We talked about his book in episode 54. Now, let's talk about the New York Times readers list of the 100 best books in the 21st century. We have 10 books on that list. That is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to start with an easy question. Does our book this month, Empire of Pain, by Patrick Radden Keefe, appear on the list. Okay. We had talked about this on the last podcast. I've done no research, (laughs) but I've done some thinking on this, and I have my list ready. (gasps) What? But I did not consider this book. So for you to bring it up means that it probably (laughs) is on this list. So I'm going to say it's a yes, because the opioid crisis has decimated part of some populations in the United States. So I'm going to give that a yes. You are exactly right. It does appear on the list. It appears as number 99 on the list of 100 for the reader's poll. Okay. It doesn't surprise me that it's a little lower on the list only because I don't think it's a well-known book. Mm-hmm. And it's a hefty one. It was on the New York Times bestseller list, but it it wasn't a book I think that would have like made the rounds of a lot of fun book clubs or anything right. like that. This is the reader. So so while I scored very low on the critics list when we <laughs> talked about that at last podcast, I think I am more in tune with what readers would like. <laughs> so I'm going to give you my list <gasps> and you're going to tell me if I'm right or not. I love this, Lydia. Okay. (laughs) Okay. After scouring our list. Yes. I think Where the Crawdads Sing has got to be on there. And you are correct. It comes in at number 59. Ding, ding. I give myself a star for that. Yep. The next one is Lessons in Chemistry. You are correct. Lessons in Chemistry. Ding, ding, ding. Number 47 on the list. The next prediction is The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue. Did not make the list. (gasps) Oh, that's a no. So sorry. That gets a frowny face. Okay. The Nightingale. The Nightingale is on the list. Okay. Number 52. Ding, ding, ding. Okay. That gets a star. I am a man. Unfortunately, no. no. I am a man is not on the list. Well, it gets one for this reader. Yeah. I thought that book was great. Yeah. A Man Called Otto. It is on the list. A Man Called Uva. Okay. Number 100 on the list. All righty. Hello, Beautiful. Hello, Beautiful did not make the list. <gasps> oh. Yeah. I only got four. Wow, I'm surprised. Well, you got five because you got Empire of Pain also. Oh, yeah. So you got half. So what were the other ones? Okay. Coming in at 93, our good friend, Shelby Van Pelt's Remarkably Bright Creatures. I was going to be on my list. I don't know why I didn't. I just didn't. Yeah, okay. This is maybe a little fudge factor because we haven't read it yet, but we will read it in November. Number 82, Tom Lake. Oh, I don't know about him. Yeah. We don't know anything about that book because we haven't read it yet. Okay. Coming in at 75, the Lincoln highway. (gasps) What? Yes. Okay. All right. Yep. Go Nebraska. (laughs) Number 46. An extremely recent book. Any guesses? Extremely recent. No. The Song of Achilles. Really? Mm hmm. Oh, I'm surprised. Okay. Mm hmm. It was a good book. Yeah, very good book. Then our highest ranked one, number 22, is what? Hamnet. What? Hamnet. Didn't we read Hamnet? <laughs> or did I, I think just? We read... I don't think I read that book, Nance. Oh, I guess I just read that book. I thought we read that book. <laughs> <laughs> the one about Shakespeare's son, Hamnet. 
No. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I, I thought we read it. Okay. okay. I've also read 19 other books on the list oh, as well. well. That's not a surprise. All really good ones. And some very well known. Oh, wait. And here's one that you've read. I know that you've read. The Glass Castle is on the list. Ah, yeah, that was a good book. Bottom line, this book, this month, Empire of Pain on the list. Okay, well, let's start talking about this book then. Okay. Okay, so last month we talked about murder. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> this month we're going to talk about mass murder. Oh, ouch. Yeah. Okay. So the book is Empire of Pain, The Secret History of the Sackler Dynasty. Mm -hmm. Last month it was all cozy and happy. The people who were murdered we didn't really mind that they were murdered. Now it's friends and neighbors and children, teenagers. It's a nonfiction book written by the investigative journalist Patrick Radden Keefe. Keefe has written three New York Times bestsellers, Empire of Pain is one, also Rogues and Say Nothing. He's received the National Magazine Award for Feature Writing, the National Book Critics Circle Award for Nonfiction, the Orwell Prize for Political Writing. He's also the writer and host of Wind of Change, an eight-part podcast which investigates the strange convergence of espionage and heavy metal music during the Cold War and was named the number one podcast of 2020 by The Guardian. Yeah. Patrick received his master's degree from Cambridge University and the London School of Economics and a law degree from Yale. He's the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship and fellowships from the New American Foundation, the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, and the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library. He writes for The New Yorker, and I've actually read a number of his pieces in The New Yorker and thought they were fabulous long before I knew that he wrote this book. His investigative journalism to me is, is just remarkable. This book really is about the opioid epidemic. I'm going to read you from an article in 2021 by the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention about why we should care about this. Okay. It says, a staggering loss of life has resulted from the ongoing epidemic. Nearly 500,000 people have died from opioid overdoses in the past 20 years. 500 thousand. Incredible. That's hard to get our minds around. Okay. It goes on to say, because many people die prematurely, their surviving family members and communities lose out on the benefits from an individual's lifetime earnings. Opioid use disorder also results in costs associated with added health care expenses, criminal justice, lost productivity, and reduced quality of life. In 2017, these costs totaled an estimated $1.02 trillion. 54% was attributed to overdose deaths and 46% to opioid use disorder, according to one analysis. That's the end of the quote, but not only horrible loss of lives and devastation, there's also an economic concern here. Not as important for me. Mm hmm over the human life toll and the havoc that it reaches out to not only those people, but the families has been really horrific in our society. Yeah, it really has been. I thought in the book, Keith did a great job describing what amounts to three waves of overdose deaths. The first wave began in the 1990s, and that was with the introduction of OxyContin by Purdue Pharma, owned by the Sackler family. Those were the deaths involving prescription opioids. The second wave begins in 2010 with increases in deaths involving heroin. Keefe describes why people moved from OxyContin to heroin. It was because the Sackler family reformulated OxyContin and made it more difficult to ingest immediately. So people moved to heroin because they were already addicted to the opioid and were looking for an alternative to OxyContin. 
And then the third wave begins in 2013 with increases in deaths involving synthetic opioids such as fentanyl. But it's really important to note that this epidemic continues. In 2023, the U.S. reached an all-time high of overdose deaths at 111,401 deaths over 12 months. It's so heartbreaking. Yeah. One of the things that they did was try to find communities and people that they felt would take oxycodone quicker than other groups. Right. And then they concentrated efforts to market their drug to those specific doctors in those areas. Yep. But according to a study by the Brookings Institute, six occupational groups accounted for a disproportionate share of the unintended and undetermined overdose deaths. And they were construction, extraction, like as a mining, food preparation serving, healthcare practitioners, healthcare support, personal care and service. So those industries have a larger population of deaths and overdoses. It's notable that these are generally jobs with high occupational injury rates. So I need the painkillers and low access to paid sick leave. The Brookings article also mentioned other studies that, and this is a quote, found that regions with higher exposure to opioid prescriptions experience significant declines in labor force participation. In a 2016 survey of men aged 25 to 54 who were not in the labor force, nearly half of the respondents reported taking pain medications on a daily basis, two-thirds of whom were taking prescription pain medications. And a follow-up survey of women in the same age group who were not in the labor force, 50 4% of the respondents reported taking medication on a daily basis, half of whom were taking prescription medications. That is incredible that people who are not in the workforce are basically experiencing chronic pain and or are hooked on opioids. Yeah. And that particular age group, I did some research on Pennsylvania Mm -hmm. and that age group of kind of middle adulthood Mm -hmm. is really where you're finding the most overdose deaths, at least in my state, from one of the things that I studied. It's not really the teenage group and it's not the senior citizen group. Mm -hmm. It's really that middle age group of where this research is. Not exactly those those years, but it's pretty close. Mm -hmm. There's a geographic story to this too. According to a CDC article, among states Nebraska has the lowest opioid overdose deaths per 100,000. Nebraska comes in at only 3.1 per 100,000 people. And I'll tell you, that definitely was my experience, that Nebraska was not facing the crisis to the same degree that other states were. The highest in comparison is West Virginia at 47.3 deaths per 100,000 people, more than 15 times more death than in Nebraska. So in general, the per capita economic costs also vary pretty dramatically across the United States. Again, the Brookings Institute report found that the hardest hit economically have been states in the Ohio Valley and New England. And I do remember When this epidemic was first starting, that here in Nebraska, we would look at these data about the opioid epidemic and how it was ravaging other states. And we could not believe that somehow we were escaping that and kept wondering, well, when is it really going to hit us? There's no way that we're going to remain at the very, very low end of this. But Nebraska has remained at the very, very low end of this. The story, of course, in Pennsylvania, dramatically different. You're a mental health professional living in Pennsylvania. What's been your experience, either professionally in a general way or just personally living in Pennsylvania, where you've experienced a lot more of the direct impacts of this? This is a part of our living now. 
I mean, we have our own little meth clinic right here in New York yeah, and a lot of our towns do. And so the methadone treatment is just a way of life for a lot of people. People know people who have to go to the meth clinic because they were taking oxycodone at the hospital and couldn't get off of it and ended up abusing the drug because they needed relief from pain. And to no fault of their own, my understanding of the withdrawal that people experience when their body becomes addicted to this medicine, it's horrifyingly painful. Yeah. I got the Narcan certification. That was pretty big in Pennsylvania. Let's get as many people out there that can give Narcan to people so that if you walk across somebody who is asleep in a car, or if you walk across or come into contact with somebody who looks like they're in distress, you know how to give them the Narcan, which was the treatment for opioid addictions, like a nasal spray. Right. That was very big in Pennsylvania. Did you go through training because you're a mental health provider or was this just like they were asking everyday people or was it through your Red Cross? It was through Red Cross. Okay. They thought we should have that. What's offered that we should have CPR. Okay. I wanted to do it because I wanted to be just one of those helpers. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing. I know that a lot of people who have opioid addiction, they were able to go and secure their own Narcon. So maybe I don't have Narcon on me, but I can look through somebody's backpack and see if they have the Narcon and can give it to them to save their life. Because the way the drug works, it's amazing at how it surrounds the opioid and takes that out of the person's system so that then they can come back to life, basically. It's a big story here in Pennsylvania. I think that now we have a little bit of a safety net here with the methadone clinics that we have, mm -hmm. but it took a long time to get there. I know fentanyl is, that's what people are talking about now more is the, the fentanyl. Mm -hmm. Just to talk to you a little bit more about Pennsylvania, I have a couple statistics I wanted to share. Pennsylvania declared the opioid crisis a statewide disaster in 2018. In 2018 to 24, in Pennsylvania alone, 96,337 doses of Narcon was used by just EMS. That's not the family members that were distributing it. People like Linda Colbertson, that was just by EMS, almost 100,000 of those. Yeah. And then for ER visits for opioids in those six years, 58,065 ER visits for opioid overdoses in Pennsylvania. Wow. That's a lot. I was watching a video from a photographer for, it was either the New York Times or the New Yorker. Now I can't remember which publication it was, but he was doing a series of photographs about the opioid crisis in America. And this was just a couple years ago. So he decided to go to Ohio since at that time, Ohio had one of the highest overdose rates in the country, this particular county. He said, literally, the morgue ran out of space and the morgue was receiving a dozen bodies every day. What he said is, we all got our wisdom teeth out. We just happened to be the lucky ones that didn't have a doctor that prescribed us OxyContin. Absolutely. Or even if it was prescribed to us, maybe we just took it once and we just never got to the point of addiction. We were lucky that we didn't. He says, these are just people who unfortunately had some sort of pain and then unfortunately had a prescription for OxyContin, and that starts the slippery slope to addiction and for 500,000 people death in our country. The first episode that he came across when he was on his trip to Ohio, he was in a police ride along because that's where he had arranged that he would be able to take photographs. He said they stopped a, about a half a block from where they were going to be, but he heard this wailing. And he's, I've never heard anything like that. What was that 
they get there. It's a mom wailing her 20 some year old son overdosed and died. He said that was my first exposure. He said, I don't think I've ever taken a harder picture than that Uh, one. And then he ended up following that family all the way through the funeral. Yeah. I mean, heartbreaking. Yeah, it really is. So we talked about the consequences of this. One of the things that really surprised me about this book is that I really expected it to basically start with the consequences, the epidemic, or the very earliest to start with the development of OxyContin. Mm -hmm. And this, of course, is the brand name of the opioid manufactured and marketed by the Sackler family, but it doesn't. It starts back in 1913 with the birth of Arthur Sackler, the uncle of Richard, and Richard is the Sackler who basically took OxyContin to the masses. I was surprised when that's how the book started, but I really like that approach because Keith does a great job of weaving in Arthur's story and his ambitions and his blind spots and the family interactions to show us how the family got to a place where they were really wanting a blockbuster drug. And then they allowed their arrogance or greed to blind them to the consequences What did you think about starting in 1913? And I think that setup was about a quarter of the book. Was that hard for you to get through? Were you interested in that historical portion of the book? It was my favorite part of the book, I think. Was it really? Yeah. I really enjoyed listening about how he grew up and his relationship with his sons. He's a medical doctor. He goes to medical school and he pays for the, the younger ones to go to medical school, as some family said back then. I find all that stuff endearing, you know, the older son helping the younger ones get through and helping to open doors for them to work in various industries. I love all that. Yeah. Because you're a playwright, you know about the arc, and we talked about the arc of people. So I love that too now, and I'm able to identify okay. it. But he starts out in psychiatry in an asylum. Yes, doing lobotomies. And I love that. Okay, so I love that. He Okay, he cares about people. Mm-hmm. I am a medical doctor. Let me figure out why electric shock works and why it doesn't. Let's figure out what's going on with the body. Now, he already knows what success is. He's really good in marketing medications. He's a good writer. Yeah. So he's got this little side job where he's making most of his money. He's not making tons of money being the medical doctor in an insane asylum. His little side job is he owns the largest pharmaceutical marketing (laughs) company in the United States. Yeah. That's his side job. Uh At the same time, all of this happens, the miracle drug penicillin starts curing people. And so all of a sudden, now we've got medication. We've got a pill that cures people. So how does this pill cure people? And what's going on? Can we think of a pill that might help the terminally ill people in asylums? Yes, we can. We have developed a pill that helps schizophrenics. So he is starting to get successful. He is starting to research drugs and medications and doing some trial runs based on the people that he has there. And he starts out with all of this really interesting background and influence. He's getting his land legs in a lot of ways. I think there's some goodness in him. I'm totally bought into him. What I'm doing, this is the influence I have. I need to make this better for people. But you start seeing even early on, there's some blind sides to him. Mm -hmm. The author didn't interview any Sacklers. Mm -hmm. He's getting all of his information other places. But you can see even early on, there's some problems that there is in the family, some problems with Richard. I don't want anybody to think that I'm analyzing somebody I have not met. Mm -hmm. However, there are some qualities 
of addictive nature in some of the people in this family. I don't know if you picked up on that or not. No. Like the guy that's collecting all this Chinese stuff, he's out of control with this. There is a lust or an adrenaline rush maybe towards money, towards power, yeah, towards wives. How many wives can I mess up? There's some kind of nature that's want, 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 and, and get, 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 that's in some of these family members that you think, what's going on with their mental health? Where are they at? Yeah. And again, he's not interviewing them. So we only get glimpses of what's this personality like? What is the diagnosis associated with some of their character traits? A lot of them do not have good interpersonal skills with other people. Right. There's some lack of empathy with some of them. So you see some real problems with the character traits in some of these family members. It does seem that there is a self-interest or entitlement mm -hmm. that Keith portrays that all of the family members have, they feel very entitled to their wealth, especially when like there was Arthur and then the next generation and boy, definitely by the third generation, that generation is like, Hey, where's my billion this month? Yeah. I need money. Let's take it out of the company. Yeah. Eventually they all just seem like a bunch of liars to me. They say under oath they weren't involved in making business decisions, but we have the memos, we have people who are in the meetings, we have all kinds of evidence that show that not only are they involved in the company, they're micromanaging decisions and they're driving their employees crazy <laughs> <laughs> because they will not let any decisions be made without their input and direction. They're going to protect the family. Yep. They're going to protect their assets. Mm -hmm. They're going to complain and argue amongst themselves. Yeah, because there are different moms that are married to these men. And so then you have divisions within the family, who is the child of which of the wives. Yeah, I had to take notes of whose wife had what kid. And yeah. That was a little ridiculous. And then near the end of the book, it gets to the point where they're not even taking care of family members. They're willing to throw family members <laughs> under the bus to save their own skins. And Richard is unwilling to testify before Congress when he's subpoenaed. So he sends his son to testify in front of the Congressional Committee. Well, they have had decades of avoiding talking and they got away with it. They sure did. Yeah. Oh, I've been subpoenaed now. Nah, I don't ever go to those. Never gone to those in the past. I'm not going now. Right. Oh, and I'll send my three employees to testify for the company that's being sued and they get found guilty. They can go to jail. Yeah. To save the family name. Yeah. We don't need the family involved. We'll send employees. No, we didn't do anything wrong. Oh, so I'd heard of the Sackler family and have read some articles about their role in the OxyContin epidemic. But what really surprised me was this marketing they used, which I was totally unaware of. They marketed to doctors directly. They felt that was necessary because they knew how skeptical doctors would be if they knew how strong this medicine was because doctors were very aware that they did not want their patients to become addicted. They did not want to give them anything that would be as strong as morphine because to them, morphine was only an end of life drug. If they're addicted, they're dying anyway, and you're really just in a pain management situation. So they manage to lie to doctors and they say, oh, OxyContin isn't stronger than morphine, when in fact, it's twice as strong as morphine. They twisted medical research. They managed to get the FDA to allow them to insert unfounded promotional language in their literature. They had these drug reps who gave out free samples for 30 days to patients. 
They lied about the length of the time the drug lasted. They lied about its addictiveness. They lied when they said they weren't aware that the drug was addictive and that some patients were experiencing addiction and that there was any possibility for withdrawal. They blamed the people who became addicted and claimed the company was being victimized by addicts. And they set up shell advocacy organizations that touted the company line about the drug being beneficial to people experiencing chronic pain. I mean, it goes on and on and on. And to me, this was absolutely infuriating. Here's where I like the author. I thought he kept it very fact-based and as truthful as possible to tell the story and without emotion with it. Mm -hmm. So as I was reading it, I was understanding it and not having a strong emotional reaction through a lot of it, believe it or not. Okay. I wasn't so angry with the Sacklers. At some point, they had some blind sides and saying, look, well, there's new information out here. No, but that old stuff worked for us. And our old messaging is so relevant for today. Now, that's a problem, right? I'm not saying they don't deserve the responsibility for what they did. Mm -hmm. But they found a study that worked for them or a doctor that said this, and they bought into it. Oh, I totally disagree. I feel like they knew it was addictive. The early studies, even in a very short span of observation, showed that the drug was wearing off much sooner Earlier. than the yeah. 12 hours it was supposed to, and that patients, as a result, were needing another pill earlier, and that additional dosage was hooking people. And they just willfully ignored that. They willfully ignored it because it worked for them. And I said, right. they are still responsible for that, but I could see how it would happen. Here's the thing. Those family members who said, look, I don't have anything to do with the business. Those are other people in my family, but they're still reaping the financial rewards of the drug that's still being sold and is still addicting people and resulting in overdose deaths. Opioid abuse, addiction, devastation. Nobody is going to argue with that. But I guess what I saying and what I appreciated is I can see how it happens. Patrick Radin Keefe does an excellent job really identifying those decision points. What is happening? What information is being used to make a decision? What information is being disregarded? What information in total was available? Who made the decision? What was the result of that decision making? You can tell he has a law degree. He does lay this out in a very dispassionate, unsensational yeah. way. Just the facts. And even the court transcript tells us that XYZ, internal memo, a former worker testifies this. And like all of the evidence, he just presents in context and invites us to come along for the ride and draw our own conclusions. Shame on the FDA for cutting their own corners and listening to a very wealthy family and not doing due diligence on this drug. That's on them too. Mm -hmm. That's supposed to be our safety net for drugs. They didn't do their job. When they went to the FDA, there was a big problem right there with the FDA and allowing this drug to be used without doing due diligence, as far as I was concerned, mm -hmm. in the approval of this medication. And if somebody just would have said, no, is no. Go back and rework it, and we can look at it next year. Or no, except for cancer, or except for last week of life, or something like that. But they didn't. Patrick Radden Keefe illustrates, though, the FTA an understaffed federal agency where there was basically one person they needed to get past in order to get their drug approved. Sad as it is, it's not like the FDA has 
hundreds of people who are going through all the studies and all the evidence for every drug. No, there was one guy, Curtis Wright, who they had to get past because he was assigned that drug and they managed to basically wine and dine him and eventually employ him. Yeah, they did. They managed to get his approval. Yeah. And I'm not sure that he realized that the Sacklers were marketing this. They were researching it. They had their hands in too many businesses and they were producing it. So you've got a conflict of interest, like you're marketing the drug that you're researching and you're manufacturing. It's too close. That was another interesting part of this book where the Sacklers worked really hard to not be associated with any of the companies they were heading. They worked very hard to keep their involvement in companies quiet, and they would send employees out, and the employees would be the face. Now, there would be a part of that that you might say, oh, well, that's very humble. That's really great. No, they were doing it for nefarious reasons because they did not want people to understand the whole network of businesses that they had interacting with related businesses. And he points out that there's this strange irony in that no one really knew where the Sackler wealth came from because they were so quiet about where their money came from. But they were huge philanthropists who wanted their names splashed all over museums and universities. They've made huge gifts nationally and internationally. In the gift documents, they were very specific about this is where our name will be. This is how this will be referred to. And they wanted all of the benefits and the glory of being donors to organizations that came from these companies that they pretended that they had no affiliation with. Yeah. Some of their donations to some of the best known organizations in the world. So there's the Sackler Wing of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where the Temple of Dender is, where you and I have both been, in fact. Yeah. There's the Sackler Gallery in Washington, D.C. There's the Sackler Museum at Harvard. Oh, I've been there. There's the Sackler Center for Arts Education at the Guggenheim. The Sackler Wing at the Louvre. Oh, I've been there. The Sackler Institutes at Columbia and Oxford and a dozen other universities. The one come up and spit at the end of the book is how the Sackler name is now being removed from a lot of these institutions. And the work of Nan Golden, famous artist and activist who has led institutions to question their taking of the Sackler money and then naming the Sacklers as donors. For me, it's a story of greed. I would agree. I think that's it right down to it. At its simplest form, greed, but I think there's a pride thing there too because of the pride of the family name. The name was tied up into these big things. So there's a power associated with that and the family dynamics, and there's certainly greed. And I loved, absolutely thought he was dead on with his parallel to gun control. Very similar so it's not the drug manufacturer's fault or our constitution's fault that people are going into high schools and blowing everybody away. That's the person's responsibility. And the same mindset was it's the drug addict's responsibility. They're the person who's abusing the drugs, not the per person that's manufacturing the drugs. Yeah. I absolutely love this book. I tend to personalize this stuff sometimes. Like, if I was in this family, what would I do? And I can see myself carrying along with it for a while. I'm not a medical doctor, but Uncle Richard's saying it's not addictive. So I'm going to believe him. I'm on the marketing side. So I'm going to come up with a marketing campaign. You're giving them a lot more credit than I am. Their chief counsel's administrative assistant ends up getting hooked on OxyContin. And instead of trying to help her, 
and address the situation. They fire her and pillarize her. But at one time, that was how a lot of people thought of drug addicted people. I guess I think that they were much more cynical in that they knew that this drug had addictive qualities and they marketed it anyway. They knew people would become addicted. In fact, they hoped people would become addicted because then that is a nice income stream for them and that they are lying and twisting the truth, exacerbating the belief that addiction to prescription drugs only happens if they are not correctly using the drug as it was formulated, right. because the drug as it was formulated was addictive. And then to say, oh, now we're going to go international <laughs> because the door is closing on the United States. Now we're going to go international. Terrible. Terrible. Terrible, right? And we're going to do it to kids. Like, yeah. But that's way removed from where we started out with. We've got penicillin. Let's start researching how we could take medicine in a pill form and market that to relieve pain for people. I will agree that there is certainly a point in the middle of the 21st century where people thought pharmaceuticals had all the answers for people living happier, healthier lives. And that it was just a matter of the right drug for whatever ails you. But I think even by the 60s with Valium, it was becoming clear that was probably not the case. Well, yeah, they were riding that wagon too. They made a lot of money off Valium. Yeah. And it was accepted because it wasn't a street drug. I guess that's what I liked about the book is because it takes place over so long. You can see that they get in way too deep. And then because of probably greed and power, they don't backtrack any of those original statements to say, look, we're in a different place now. We have a history of understanding this. We need to take a step back. Yeah. I definitely think they deserve all the, the consequence of this and the bad name. Sorry, that's on you guys now. Yeah. Not sorry. You get what you deserve. I thought it was fascinating. I really did. Well, I'm glad you like it because it was a great big book. Yeah, I got it on audio. Over 500 pages, although maybe the last hundred or so is sources. Yeah. Citations, index acknowledgement, very well documented. And this is probably the only book we have done out of the last 41 books that I wish I would have had this as a hard copy, a personal copy, not my Kindle, but a personal copy, because there were things that I would have liked to have highlighted and gone back and looked like, wait a second, what was that study? I want to look at that study. And when did author know about that study? So some of this was confusing to me because of the way I listened to this mm -hmm. to say, no, wait a minute. When was that research done where that guy went and told them, hey, we got it from our research department. We right. got a problem with this Oxycontin. We're looking at and we're, we're thinking there's some addictive nature to this. Like, I can't tell you when that study was. I don't remember if it was Richard. I'm thinking it's Richard turned a blind eye to it. Right. There was a date where that was a memo that he should have said. Pretty early on. <laughs> Thank you very much. But he is the CEO and he turned a blind eye to that. Right at that point, you are 100% responsible for everything that happened after that. Yeah. My recommendation is people that want to get this book, don't do it on audio. Don't do it on your Kindle. Get a hard copy of it. You got all those good references in the back there. You can go back and create your own timeline of when you think, oh, Richard, stop. Right. It's a real eye opener for me on how do people become addicted? And there is a personal story there of like, I understand pain and I don't want to be in pain. Yeah. I am a susceptible person to this problem because I don't want to be in pain. If some doctor gives me a pill so I'm not pain, I'm happy to take it and say, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And how lucky are you? You weren't in a car accident that hurt you in some way with chronic pain and a doctor prescribed you Oxycontin. I have my wisdom teeth out. I've, so I could have been given this. 
I mentioned it's a great big book. I do feel like everyone in the United States should read it, but I think that probably everyone in the United States will not read this book. No. I have two suggestions for people who don't want to read the book, but who want to know more about this story. The first is that the author, Patrick Radden Keefe, wrote an article in The New Yorker in 2017 about the Sackler family. And I remember reading that article at that time. It's excellent. It lays out a lot of the information that ends up being in this book. It was published on October 23rd, 2017, and it's called The Family That Built an Empire of Pain. Hmm. Obviously, that article was a part of putting this book together. I will put a link to that in our show notes. And then the second is a Netflix series, so very easy to consume, called Painkiller. And this series stars Matthew Broderick, who I love. He plays Richard Sackler. Really? Yes. Is that on Netflix now? It's on Netflix now. Oh, I'm going to... Okay, after the Olympics. (laughs) I will look that up. It is excellent. And it's a portrayal of the story that we read in this book. Oh, okay. It very faithfully follows the story in this book. It is a series that will enrage you because of the decisions and the willful ignorance and greed, but it is so good. There are some people there who are amalgamations of people, but as some of it you're looking at and you're saying, oh, I actually remember reading about that court testimony. Oh, look. There is the chief counselor's administrative assistant getting hooked on the very drug. So you are going to meet people in that series who we read about in this book. Okay. I'm looking forward to it, especially if they're going to stay true to the facts. Yeah. I would like to see somebody's interpretation of who Richard was. Mm -hmm. We also meet a consequence of the Sackler family decisions along the way, a parallel story that is absolutely heartbreaking. Okay, excellent. Oh, I'm looking forward to that. I'm glad that you know about that, and I am going to watch it. Nancy, I could go on a couple more hours about this, and what I thought about it, there's some political stuff in there that we didn't even touch on. There's just a lot, and I really enjoyed it. So I... I'm highly recommending this book to anybody. Our next drop is going to be with somebody who knows about the opioid crisis. Our guest is going to be Aniri Patani, and she is a senior correspondent for the Kaiser Family Foundation. She's focusing on mental health and substance abuse disorders. I am so looking forward to talking to her about opioid abuse And also, she is going to be talking to us about a recent Supreme Court decision and a whole lot more about our subject matter. So we are delighted. Yeah, she is going to be great to talk to. The book concludes in 2020. She will be able to bring us up to date. This story continues, not only the opioid crisis, but also the Sackler family and Purdue Pharma. Yeah, it will be very interesting to to hear where do we go from here? We've got all these people addicted. Now, what do we do? Mm -hmm. Well, everyone, thanks so much for listening. Our website is frontporchbookclub.com. Our episodes come out twice a month on the first and third Wednesday of every month. All right, Vinny. See you next time. See ya. Bye-bye.